Hi and welcome back to our next topic, demand. In this video we'll learn about one of the most important topics in economics, which is how to define and illustrate demand. We like to define demand by using the term willing and able to buy. In the study of economics, if you demand a good or service, then you actually want it, can afford it, and finally, you plan on actually buying it. So window shopping does not count. We know that our wants are unlimited, so we cannot use that definition to define demand. We need to include our budgets to help illustrate what we can actually afford, while our actions indicate our plan to go out and buy something. So all three of these criteria of we want, we can, and we will determines our demand. We then need to determine the actual amount an individual wants. I might be able and willing to buy three bags of rice, while my neighbor is willing and able to buy seven. Each of these amounts is referred to as the quantity demanded of each good for each individual. If we add all the bags of rice demanded by a population, we then get the total population's quantity demanded for rice. This is the actual amount people are demanding of a certain good for a specific period, usually around a year. The most important factor influencing our quantity demanded is price, or the price level. If the price of rice had to increase, then my neighbor and I would likely demand less rice. Because demand is such an important concept in economics, and because the price level is so influential on our demand, we use what we call the law of demand to describe this very important relationship. The law of demand states, holding all else constant, the higher the price of a good or service, the lower the quantity demanded for that good or service, and vice versa. This law states that if we ignore all other things that might influence demand, like tastes, perceptions, or natural disasters, then the higher the relative price of a good or service, or in other words, the more expensive a good is compared to other goods, the lower the quantity demanded for that good or service. This is simply a description of something quite obvious. We tend to buy more of something if it is considered affordable, and less of something if it is considered expensive compared to other things we could buy. When prices or our preferences change, our quantity demanded for certain goods changes too. When this happens, there are two things, or more accurately, effects, which take place that define how large things change in quantity demanded. The two effects are the substitution effect and the income effect. The substitution effect is the effect which takes place when you start considering alternative goods or services. Let's say all prices and your income remain unchanged, except for the price of cola which experiences an increase in price. Because you still want to drink a soft drink, but don't want to pay more, you start to consider alternatives, perhaps other flavored soft drinks or other types of beverages like bottled water. The relative rise in the price of cola, or any other good for that matter, causes consumers to seek alternative options so that they are just as well off as before the price increase. This will lower the quantity demanded for the good which is now more expensive, in our case cola, and increase the quantity demanded of the alternative good. The income effect on the other hand has to do with the price change of a good or service relative to income and not relative to the price of other goods. When the price of a good increases relative to income, the buyer now has less money left over to purchase other goods or services. This decrease in the overall amount of goods the individual can buy can be seen as a fall in real income and leads to a lower quantity demanded for the now more expensive good, which in our case is cola. The consumer now demands less cola so that he or she can buy the same amount of all the other goods that he or she bought before the increase in the price of cola. It is important to realize that both the income and substitution effects occur simultaneously and with different degrees of impact or influence. It is not easy to separate out the two effects accurately 
and sometimes the substitution effect is greater than the income effect or vice versa. What is important for now, before we model each of these effects in later chapters, is that you understand that a relative price increase or decrease changes the way in which we look at other goods which may now be more or less expensive and changes the way we look at what our income can afford us. An easy way to remember each effect is to think of each effect's name. The substitution effect relates to the buyers substituting the more expensive good with a different less expensive good, while the income effect relates to the rise in the price level impacting the amount someone can now buy with the same level of income. And don't forget, both effects apply to either an increase in price or a decrease in price. Once we fully understand demand, supply and budget levels, we'll be able to discuss these two effects in more detail. But for now, all you need to know is that there are two different effects impacting our quantity demanded when there is a change in the price level. So let's start drawing our demand curve. The first thing we need to discuss is what axis makes sense for a demand graph from which we can investigate changes in demand. The first important factor we'll want to include is relative price. The price or relative price is so important in determining quantity demanded that we need to make it explicit. Notice how we don't explicitly use relative price even though it's actually what we're plotting. The reason is because there are many goods and services to choose from so the price you see used for demand graphs or even supply graphs are relative prices and not necessarily the price you would pay in a store. In economics, we almost always plot prices on the vertical or y-axis. The next key element we want to know is the actual quantity demanded at each price level. The quantity demanded values are usually plotted on the horizontal axis or x-axis. We now have the right axes for our demand graph. All we now need is some additional information which describes the relationship between price and demand. This information is usually provided to you either in a table or already plotted on a graph. Table A provides us with some of the price and quantity demanded combinations which we can label A to E. So table A shows Pete's demand schedule for coal. It shows the quantity of coal that Pete is willing and able to buy at each different price level. In order to better see or illustrate the relationship between the price level and the quantity demanded, let's plot our price and demand combinations on our axes. We can now plot each of the points from A to E onto the axis. For instance, point A represents the point where coal is relatively expensive at $25 per kilogram. So Pete in this case will only be willing to buy 50 kilograms. Point B, on the other hand, represents a lower price level, and according to the law of demand, a lower price will lead to a higher quantity demanded. And this is exactly what we see here. At point B, the price level drops to $20 a kilogram, and the quantity that Pete will now buy is 70 kilograms, or 20 kilograms more than point A. Recall our discussion on the income and substitution effects. When the price of coal changed from $25 to $20 a kilogram, Pete realized that other goods now look more expensive and that because the price of coal has decreased that he has more income left over to spend on other things, such as more coal. So the income and substitution effects together help explain the increase in the quantity demanded for coal. However, it's not easy to see it or to calculate exactly how large each effect is. Let's continue plotting the rest of the points from C to E. You can already see that the demand curve looks to be downward sloping. If we connect the dots, we can see the overall relationship between price and quantity demanded. The downward sloping demand curve labeled D represents a negative relationship between price and quantity demanded, which is exactly what the law of demand proposes. When the relative price goes up for a good or service, the quantity demanded for that good or service will go down. And when the relative price of a good goes down, 
the quantity demanded will go up. Also note that points A to E are not the only combinations possible. All points along the demand curve represent price and quantity demanded combinations. In reality, we would not fit such smooth demand curves if we had to ask consumers how much they would be willing to buy at different prices. However, we would still find a similar relationship between price and quantity demanded. The purpose of the graph is not to anticipate or forecast demand, but rather to study the consequences of shocks or changes to demand. As we progress in this course, you will begin to realize how complex demand is and how much we can learn and discuss by using the demand curve, especially when we combine it with other curves. You might find other textbooks or educators using straight line demand curves. There is no real difference or concern between using a straight line or curved line. The curved line does introduce some additional characteristics, but fundamentally is no different to a straight line demand curve. A straight line curve is also easier to model mathematically and becomes, in a sense, more user-friendly when introducing other graphs or concepts which require some mathematical equations. But for now though, we'll continue to use a curved demand curve, but do not be concerned if we switch to a straight line in any later chapters. So far, we have concentrated on just one consumer, but in reality, there is more than one buyer in each market. By adding the quantities demanded by all consumers at each of the various possible prices, we can start investigating the overall market demand instead of just one individual's demand. Let's assume there are only two buyers in the market for party clowns. We'll call these buyers Mike and Shelley. Figure A is Mike's individual demand curve for party clowns labeled DM. Notice that the y-axis represents the hourly rate for hiring a clown, while the x-axis represents how many hours Mike will rent a clown for per week. So when the hourly price is $2, Mike will hire a party clown for only one hour per week. Figure B is Shelley's demand curve for party clowns, labeled DS. If the going hourly rate is $2, then according to Shelley's demand curve, she will want to hire a clown for two hours per week. Shelley, in this case, seems to like or need party clowns more than Mike. If we sum up each quantity demanded by Mike and Shelley horizontally for each price level, then we would obtain the total quantity demanded at that price for the entire market. If we then plot these values, we will get the market demand curve for party clowns. For instance, if we add up each individual's demand at $2 per hour, we get a total market demand of 3 hours per week. We can plot these totals in figure C. Mike will purchase one hour, while Shelley will purchase two hours. So in figure C, we plot a point which represents three hours demanded at a price of $2 per hour. We can then do the same for demand at a price level of $1 per hour. At $1 per hour, we can see that Mike will purchase two hours of party clown time, while Shelley, who likes clowns more, will purchase three hours per week. This gives us a total of five hours demanded which we plot on point D in figure C. Now that we have two points, we can simply connect them and draw the total market demand curve, or D. If there were many buyers, we could simply assume they all demanded the same at each price level and then just multiply demand at each price level by the total number of buyers to get the total market demand. 